God is love. He is love. And not just that, we also find that in God as in Jesus is not only love, but he is the truth, he is the way, and he is the life. And there's no other way to eternal life except <clears throat> through him. And he had to lay down his life in order to give us life. And we think about <clears throat> the great commandment. <clears throat> you know, Jesus said the great commandment. The greatest of all commandments is the first commandment. Hear, O Israel, hear this. The great commandment is that you should love the Lord your God with all your mind, all your heart, all your strength, all your soul. You are to love him. So how do we love the Lord? You know, of all the virtues and the values that we have as human beings, love is the chief among all of them. Amen? We want to love. We want people to love. We want someone. We want someone special to love. Amen? We are made that way. Is that right or wrong? I mean, that's why we have marriage, isn't it? That's why we have children. We bear children. <clears throat> and we love them. We have a natural love for them. And we have a desire. We're created to have a desire to love, to express love, to pour out our love and our devotion upon someone. We all want someone special. That's why we look for a mate, a soulmate, someone that we become one with. Amen? <clears throat> and God created it that way. And see, God, his heart yearns for you. His desire is for you. He wants you. He created you for himself. The Bible says that all things were created by God and for God and for his glory. Jesus went to the cross because we were hopelessly lost in our sins. We find in Romans chapter 3, quoting the Old Testament, <clears throat> all have sinned. All have sinned. From the, there's none that are good, none that are righteous. None have ever been righteous. Now, righteousness has been imputed to people because of faith. But none of us has ever produced a righteousness worthy of our Creator on our own. <clears throat> we receive the righteousness. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, it says that Jesus became sin. Now, it wasn't just that he took our sins, he became sin. Think about that. The sinless one, the one in, in, from all eternity, and no sin was found in him. And sin is an abomination to God. And he not just took our sins, like as if, you know, well, I'm going to bear these on my shoulder. I'm going to carry these sins around on my shoulder for you and take them to the cross. It's not he became sin. 2 Corinthians 5, he became cursed. He became our curse. Because wherever there's sin, there's a curse. We've all been selfish. We've all sought our own way. We've ignored, we've spurned the living God who loves us with all of his heart. We've all done that. You know, if you've ever had very many close relationships, you've been hurt. There's been times, dark times, when you've your eyes were never dry. Because you can feel the pain. Not only your pain, but you can feel the pain of the pain of loss. Not just your loss, but the loss of someone you, you love. But you're separated from.
You know, the reason that we have a desire to love and to express our love for someone special, someone set apart, very special, is because we are made in the image of God. That's why we're made in the image of God. We feel that yearning. We experience that. Because he does. He yearns for you. His heart aches for you. We know what it's like, you know, to put our heart out there. And pour out love. That is not readily received. Amen? And it's not expressed back the same way. And it hurts. Ladonia, you, you ask for prayer for your family. You know, the reason that's on your heart is because you yearn for that right reconciliation. You, you yearn for the... For, things being put right, or things being right, or you care for someone that you love. God does that for us. You see, you and I were created <clears throat> by him and for him. And Jesus went to the cross for the joy set before him. And we are that joy. You know, he wanted a bride. God wanted a bride. Somehow, at some point, as God said in the beginning, when he created man, before he created Eve, and he looked, and, and, and as I mentioned last week, <clears throat> Adam named all the animals. Now, he saw, the Bible says that God created everything. He created all the animals on the, on the, uh, on the sixth day. And it says he created both male and female. I don't know if you're aware of this, but did you know there are male and female trees? Did you know that? There are male and female trees. Experts know the difference. I don't really know the difference. I've had it pointed out to me before, but I'm, I'm terrible at identifying trees. I don't really know why that is. I guess it hasn't been important enough for me to try to remember what different trees look like. But... In the beginning, God made male and female. Except when it came to making someone in his image, he made Adam. And think about it. The heavenly hosts, they're looking on. They're looking on. They're saying, he's making. Now, you know, when we think about the animals, they're animal kinds in heaven. We see creatures around the throne of God that look like animals. Amen. They have wings, but they have faces like animals. Like there's a bull there. There's an eagle there. You know, there's lions. I mean, there's those things in, in the heavenly. So many, probably everything that we see on the earth is probably a shadow of a heavenly reality. Just like the temple and other things, places on the earth. But God made everything. He made, when the angels looked down, they probably saw, well, that's familiar. There's, there's an animal that, and made a flesh that looks kind of like me. That looks like me. And, but then when it came, he, he, he scooped up that dirt and he made a man. And as he's shaping that, you know the angels are watching. And the Bible says that the angels look to the church to try to understand the mysteries of God. You see, they see, they're wondering, they yearn to know, they want to know. The Bible says they long to know the mystery of the ages. What is man, David said, that you are mindful of him? What am I? And though the angels saw that he created all the animals, and then he reached down personally with his own hand. Everything else he spoke into existence, but not man. He did not say, let there be man in my image. That was too personal. He said, let dry land appear. Let lights appear. Let the animals be. And, and 
<coughs> let the waters divide. He, all of that, the plants come forth. He, he did all these things, but not when it came to man. When it came to man, he reached down to the earth and he scooped up some of that dirt and he began to fashion out of that dirt something that looked like him. And the angels were astonished. You know they were. And they were looking. And they had seen. Now angels are neither male nor female, even though they're given uh, male names <coughs> in the Bible. And they appear as men, we find in the Bible. Sometimes they appear as men. But the Bible says they neither marry nor are given in marriage. So they're, they're, they're not, they, they don't have a gender as far as a sexual gender. They do not reproduce. But God made all the animals, and he said, now you are going to reproduce after your own kind. Within you is a seed that will be planted in an egg, and it will produce after its own kind. So go forth and multiply the earth, fill the earth with your kinds. And God said it was good. Then he reached down, and he's making Eve. The angels are seeing all this. Think about what, what are they thinking when they see that. They're seeing reproduction. Now they've seen creation, amen? But what they have not seen is reproduction. No reproduction, just creation. Now they were, they're created beings. They know they're created beings. They understand that they're created beings. And, and the other fellow creatures, the seraphim, the creatures around the throne, the cherubim, all of them are created beings, and they know that. Now he makes creatures that he creates that have the ability to reproduce after their own kind. And they're wondering, they're in amazement. And then when they see God reach down and take that dirt and he begins to fashion and they sing, they see that he's making something in his own image. And then very personally and intimately, he breathes, re, bends down and he breathes life into that, that image of clay. And Adam became a living soul. But Adam was alone. And so all the angels are looking around there saying, male and female which is able to reproduce after their own kind and multiply the earth. But here is man alone in the image of God. And God is alone in his own kind. God the Father and God the Son. And Adam had to look around. He had to see all the animals and he named them all and he knew they were male and female. And I wonder, did he wonder about himself? Did you look around? Because the Bible says there was, there was not a mate suitable for Adam. So he had to be thinking about it. Amen. And then God said something. He said, it is not good for man to be alone. But you know, when he decided to make a mate for Adam, he did not reach down and get more dirt. He did not make woman apart, separate from the man. He took Eve out of Adam. He reached in, caused Adam to probably the sleep of death, actually, picturing what Jesus would do. Pitch, hands on, Jesus doing this, picturing what he would once do, where he would once be wounded in the side, right here, by his ribs. And that wound in Adam, and he reached in and he fashioned, and he got that rib, and he fashioned the first woman from the first man. And then he gave that woman back to the man, that they would become one flesh, and he said, go forth and multiply. Now that was God's plan. So now we find, especially in the book of Song of Solomon, and we find throughout, like uh, 1 Corinthians, or 2 Corinthians chapter 11, where the Apostle Paul <coughs> said to the church, I'm afraid for you. 
I'm afraid you're going to be deceived. I'm afraid you're going to be led astray from the simplicity of devotion, of love. I'm afraid you're going to get to thinking that what God wants most out of you is to learn stuff. <laughs> it's to be a Bible scholar. But what he wants is simple devotion. Now you have to be, you know, know how to do that. But he wants devotion. He wants your love. He wants your devotion. That's what he desires. He is devoted to you. And he wants your devotion. He wants that love returned and expressed. And Paul's saying to the church, to the church at Corinth, he said, I'm worried. I'm, I, I'm, I'm afraid. I'm afraid that, the, that as the serpent deceived Eve, he's going to deceive you. And you're going to stray away from simple devotion and love to the Lord. And then he said this, because I betrothed you, your promise to him, you're his bride, and your promise to him, and he has a desire for you for a pure bride. You know, we find in Revelation chapter 19 that Christ returns when the bride has made herself ready. When she has been clothed, it was given to her. That means power was given to her. She doesn't, she doesn't have to make her own garments. She receives the garments, the deeds, the garments of righteousness. And she has the power by the Spirit to walk in them, to clothe herself with that righteousness. <clears throat> and it says that the Lord returns, Revelation 19, when he sees that the bride has made herself ready. That reminds me of another thing. You know, we are, we are a temple of God, amen? We find in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, Paul said, do you not know that you're a temple? That you're a temple of God? If the Spirit dwells in you, you are a temple of God. You are the living temple of the living God, and God will dwell in you by the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> now, we want, and the Bible tells us to pray that we would be filled by the Holy Spirit. But when we think about when Solomon built the temple, well, when, <clears throat> you know, Moses built the tabernacle, the Spirit of the Lord filled the tabernacle when? When it was completed. And you know, how was it completed? Well, it was completed when everyone who had been assigned a task in making whatever it happened to be, the curtains, the, the, <clears throat> the uh, uh, doors, you know, the, the brazen altar, <clears throat> the, uh, the articles, of, you know, the table of showbread, the table of incense, whatever it happened to be, there were people assigned to make everything that had to do with the worship there. And when it was completed, that's when the Spirit of the Lord, that's when the presence of God came to the temple. We find the same thing when God, when Solomon built the temple. When he built that magnificent temple, the Spirit of the Lord, the glory of God fell and filled that temple so much that the priest could not even stand to worship. When? When it was finished, when it was ready. The Spirit of the Lord did not fill the temple until the temple was finished, until it was ready, until it was prepared. Amen? And that tells us that the Lord is looking for a prepared temple to pour his spirit in, to fill with his presence, amen? And when we receive that, we will receive what he is. We'll receive that all-consuming, fiery love that he has for his beloved. The Lord wanted a bride, and we're his bride. And he's coming for a pure bride. He doesn't want to share us with someone else. And we think of it, 
collectively, okay, the church collectively, individual members of one body, and we're all together, and that's true, we are. We're individual members of one body, and we're all together, and collectively we are the bride. But you know what the Lord is, you know, if you ever notice with your own body, your own body is a part of a collective whole. But every part of the body is interdependent. There's a certain amount of independence in every member of the body too. You see, there's independence in this finger right here. Now this finger is dependent upon the muscles, the bone, you know, the ligaments, the brain to tell it what to do. It's interdependent, but it can operate dependently too. Amen. And I believe that, you know, we think of ourselves as the body of Christ, individual members um, of Christ, the bride of Christ, but it's, <clears throat> it's more personal than that to the Lord. You know, the, God has the ability for you for, for, to have a fellowship and a relationship and an intimacy with you as if there's no one else on the earth. Amen? Nobody else. It can just be you. And we see that in the scriptures. Where God, you know, he's the God of all. But he would come to individual people. And he would have special fellowship like he did with Moses. Like he did with Abraham. Like he did with David. Like he did with the prophets of old. Let's turn over to 1 John chapter 4. But God wants you. And the question is always this. Do we want him? How bad do we want him? <clears throat> Does our heart yearn for the living God? Do we thirst for the living God like David did? <clears throat> Are we satisfied with just receiving blessings from the Lord? Are we satisfied with just knowing that you're saved and you're not going to go to a fiery torment in hell? Is that what you want? Because listen, you will get what you want. Jesus told the Pharisees, Behold, you have your reward. You, you have what you want. You don't want me. You don't really want God. You want to be honored by people. You, you want to be greatly respected. You want to sit in the most prominent places at the banquets. You want, when you walk in the streets, you want everyone to, to bow their head in reverence to you because they see you're in large tassels and they know that you know the Bible and you study and you're very knowledgeable in the scriptures, you see. Is that really what God wants? Now, I'm not saying, the Bible tells us to study the Scriptures. But why? That's the question, isn't it? Why? Just to know something? Why? What are the, why are the scriptures, scriptures given to us, you know, except to pursue God? For the scriptures tell us what, what is offensive to God, tells us what is dear to God, tells us about his character. His commandments show us love. You know, Jesus said that, you know, all the commandments can be summed up in love toward God and love toward your neighbor. And then Jesus gave that one commandment, you love one another as I have loved you, even laying down your life for one another. We're really not there yet, you know. But <clears throat> that's where the Lord wants to take us. That's where he wants us to go. When we think about how did people love God? Well, how did the Apostle Paul love the Lord? Well, the Apostle Paul was a great man before he came to the Lord, before Jesus struck him on the road to Damascus. 
His name was Saul. He was a prominent rabbi. He was surpassing all of his contemporaries. He would have been known in Jewish history as one of the greatest rabbis of all time. He would have been included in the Talmud as one of the greatest common commentators on the Old Testament scriptures. And he said that of himself, that he was surpassing all of his contemporaries. And he said, well, these Jewish people that are coming to trouble you, you know, he said, are they, uh, you know, are they an Israelite? Well, I am, even more so, of the tribe of Benjamin. I'm a Pharisee of the strictest sect. Of the law, I was blameless. But he said, I count it all as rubbish, as nothing, to knowing my Lord Jesus Christ. You see, he knew the Lord. How do you know the Lord? How do you know him? That's the whole point. See, the Lord is calling us. So how did Paul do? Well, Paul, God struck him. Jesus struck him on the road to Damascus, and he said, I've chosen you. You're going to be my vessel to go to the Gentiles to preach this gospel. And I'm going to show you how much you must suffer. And you know we find in 1 Corinthians chapter 11 that that's one thing that it takes love to do is to suffer long, to suffer patiently, to suffer without finding fault, to suffer without blaming someone else or something else. Love suffers long, and that's what it takes. Paul was going to have to suffer, and in order to suffer rightly and justly and righteously, he was going to have to have the love of God poured out upon him. So how did the Apostle Paul love the Lord with all of his heart? As the bride of Jesus, what did this faithful man do? Well, he worked tirelessly. He suffered. He was beaten more times than he could count. He was whipped with rods. He was whipped with, with whips. He was in danger. He, it was times when he suffered hunger and exposure. And he was in the ocean all night long, you know. And now this didn't escape the Lord. And it grew his faith. You know, we often think, well, why doesn't the Lord come to my aid right now? We don't always know the why. We just have to know there is a why. But why did God, why did, he, why did he wait 25 years to give Abraham his son after he promised it? God in his infinite wisdom knows when to do what at whatever time. But Paul, you know, he lived his entire life for the glory of God. He preached the gospel. He went on all these missionary trips all over the world, and he preached the gospel. And he suffered as, uh, uh, as a result of it. He was arrested twice, and finally he was beheaded and killed for the sake of the gospel. That's love. That's love. It took love to do that. He loved the Lord. He didn't get bitter. He didn't get angry. You know, he didn't cry out and say, why do I have to do this? He, he didn't understand everything, just like we don't. But he knew who God was, and he knew God was faithful. Amen. We think about the woman <clears throat> who was caught in adultery. You know, and we think about the woman also that Jesus forgave. And we think about the woman, you know, that came. We have two, two accounts of, you know, before, for example, in, in John's gospel, we find that right after Jesus resurrected Lazarus, Lazarus was in the grave for four days and four nights. And Jesus resurrected him. And the response of the religious leaders was, we have to kill him. We have to kill him. And we find that, I think in the very next chapter in John, that Mary and Martha 
were at Lazarus' house, you know, Jesus was there. And Mary, Martha's sister, Lazarus' sister, came in with an expensive jar of perfume and anointed the Lord's body. Now, a similar event happened when a prostitute did that, when Jesus was in Lazarus, not Lazarus, but Simon the Pharisee's house. You remember that account that's in Luke chapter 7. And so here comes Jesus is there with Simon the Pharisee eating dinner. And then this woman comes in and she has this expensive perfume. I mean, it's a year's wages to purchase. That's how expensive it is. Whatever you make in a year, that's what it takes to buy that little jar of perfume. And she brought that in. She not only anointed the Lord, but she came into a Pharisee's house. Now that took courage. That took love. That took devotion. And she pressed through. And do you think somebody may have tried to stop her from entering? I do. I do. I mean, I don't think she was, just, you know, that she just came through. You know, there was a lot of people there. And, I, and here comes this prostitute, which they do. I mean, they didn't even want this woman to even be in their presence. She comes through and she sees Jesus and she loves him. She has no hope in this world except the one sitting there in that Pharisee's house. And she falls at his feet and she begins to weep. And she cried so much that the feet of Jesus became wet. She washed his feet with her tears and she dried his feet with her hair. And this was a, just a total abomination to all the Jewish, all the Jews who were there. And, Pharisee, and, and Simon the Pharisee is thinking this. And he sees her pour this perfume out on Jesus also. Cries, washes his feet with her tears, dries his feet with her hair, which is given to her for a glory as a covering. And she uses it on the Lord's feet and anoints him with that perfume. The Pharisees know the expense of that perfume. And they're indignant. And Simon is thinking, hmm, if this man was really a prophet, he would know what manner of woman was touching him. He wouldn't allow such a woman to even touch his feet. No godly man would do that. <laughs> This guy must not be a God. That's what he's thinking. Jesus knew that. Now, before we, we get into what Jesus said, and Jesus did say, your sins are forgiven, daughter. Daughter, your sins are forgiven you. And then, that shocked everyone. I mean, they're thinking, who is this? What man has the ability or the power? That's an abomination. To forgive sins? Only God can forgive sins. Precisely. That's who was sitting there. And then he told the story about someone who was in debt Someone who had a small debt, someone who had a large debt, and he said, who do you think, they're both for their debts were forgiven, who do you think appreciates it more? Well, the one who has a larger debt, I suppose. Exactly. And she, who is forgiven much, loves much. Whoever's forgiven much, loves much. They appreciate it even more. But here, Simon is questioning Jesus and who Jesus is. And I want to, to understand this is a long chapter in Luke chapter 7. A lot has already happened. The timeline, the context of that happening was just before that, and Simon knew this, all the Jews knew this, 
a centurion, a Roman centurion who loved the Jews, who actually built a synagogue for the Jews. And who, you know, was very favorable and helped protect the Jews. And the Jews appreciated this man. Uh, a centurion, a Roman centurion, but a very humble man. That's rare for a Roman to be humble. And it's even very extra rare for a Roman centurion who's in charge of a hundred men, you see, under him, to, to be humble. But he was a humble man. He was so humble that he wouldn't come to Jesus. He had a servant who he loved. And his servant was deathly ill. But he would not come to Jesus. He sent some of his servants to go to Jesus and ask Jesus to heal his, his dying servant. And Jesus said, I'll come. And he started on the journey to the centurion's house, but then when the centurion heard that, his servants rushed back and said, he's coming here. Oh no, I can't have him come here. I can't have him come here. Go and tell him, I'm a man of authority, I understand. I have people under me, I tell this one to come, this he comes, I tell this one to go, he goes. And I know he can do the same thing. Just say that my servant is healed and he'll be healed. And he said this, tell him that I'm not even worthy for him to be under my roof. I'm not worthy. That's some humility. And so the servants came back and they told Jesus that. And he marveled and he said, I haven't seen faith like this in all Israel. He hadn't seen humility like that either, too much. And so Simon the Pharisee knew that it happened. That man, that, that centurion servant was healed. And the word spread everywhere. Now Jesus was making his way to Simon the Pharisee's house for dinner. And he's passing through this little community, this little village nearby called Nain, N-A-I-N. It's called Nin now, N-E-I-N. But it was Nain at the time on the Bible. And out of the city came a great crowd of people. And it was a funeral. And they were carrying a coffin of a young man who had died. And his mother who was, happened to be a widow, and she was weeping bitterly. And Jesus saw them coming out through the gates of the city to go out to the burial. And he had compassion. And he came up to the woman, and he said, stop weeping. And then he went to the coffin, and he said, Rise, come to life. And the top opened, and he sat up, and he began to speak. Now, Jesus had just raised the dead. He had healed a man long distance, without even touching him, without seeing him. Just commanding with a word. That's what happened before he entered in to Simon the Pharisee's house. And Simon the Pharisee is thinking, he must not be even a prophet because he's letting this unclean woman touch him. We can learn some lessons from that. Amen. You know what he saw? He saw a humble, contrite, broken hearted woman who was stuck in a profession that she didn't want to be in. You know? Had no one to take care of her. She was grieved. And the Lord said, your sins 
are forgiven. Amen. Now here in 1 John, we'll begin in chapter 4, verse 16. <clears throat> John says, we have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. And that's so important for us. Because the devil will always get you to question God's love for you. You know, I know that Jesus is greatly anticipating his return. When he comes back for his bride, he's anticipating the wedding banquet. He's anticipating all that. He has joy in his heart. He has hope of good things to come. And he's looking forward to that day. You know, we have days that we, and events and times that we look forward to. For us, you know, we think of the Feast of Tabernacles. We look forward to that. There's other things we look forward to. But then there's things we don't look forward to, amen, that what we just have to do or have to go through or whatever. But I've often thought that God's most dreaded day is the day that he has, at judgment, has to say, depart from me, you who practice lawlessness. You see, it doesn't, the Lord is not callous. He's not hard. He's not like, it, it, it takes no pleasure in the fate of the wicked. He doesn't. He takes no pleasure in that. You know, if God, if you make something to perform a particular specific function, if it doesn't do it, it's not worth much to you, is it? I mean, if, if you... If you have a coffee cup that leaks, <laughs> you're either going to fix it or you are going to throw it away and get you another cup. Amen? Because if something is designed for it, I mean, you know, if you buy a car and it won't go, well, nobody buys a car to just sit, <laughs> sit out in the driveway and, you know, I'm going to go sit in my car for a while. I mean... You, you want to go somewhere in your car. That's why you have a car. So you've got a choice. You fix it. If it's fixable, if it's not fixable, you get rid of it. Right? You see, God has made us for himself. He didn't make us for me. He didn't make me for me or you for you. He made you and he made me for him. And we have to fulfill the purpose for which we were made. Amen? We were made for his glory. Amen? And to bring him glory. We were made in his likeness. We are made to be one with him. We're made. We are the bride. And he is the groom. And that's the relationship that we have with the Lord. And we have the picture of that on this earth. But you know what? Listen to me. What we have on this earth is until death do you part. And that's it. You know, some Pharisees, or not Pharisees, Sadducees actually, asked Jesus, because they didn't believe in a resurrection like the Pharisees did. But the Sadducees didn't. And so the Sadducees trying to catch Jesus and said, well, let's so suppose, you know, that uh, a woman has a husband, her husband dies, her brother takes her, and then he dies, her brother takes her, and then he dies. And, and then whose wife is she at the resurrection? They're trying to prove there is no resurrection. And Jesus said, well, nobody's. Nobody's, because at the resurrection, it's like angels. You neither marry nor give in marriage. But the truth is, the first fruits are given in marriage collectively to the Lord Jesus Christ. And so that's what we're made for. Amen. And if we don't fulfill the purpose for which we made, we're not, not very much used to the Lord. Amen. Verse 16. We have come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love. And the one who abides in love abides in God and God abides in him. 
By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. You know, Love is the answer. Love is the answer. Nothing works without love. None of the gifts work without love. Uh, We can't fulfill our purpose without love. And we can't really have love except that we pursue and we receive it from him. It's got to be his love. We can have a worldly love. We can love our own. But that's a selfish love. God's love is not selfish. God's love does not seek its own. God's love is not jealous, it's not envious, you see. Love is patient and kind and long-suffering. We love because he first loved us. Verse 20, if someone says, I love God, but he hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. And we had a great spiritual move here in 2019. And it was simply uh, one Friday night, we had praise and worship, praise and prayer service. And it had got to be just too much of a routine and I was pierced in the heart. And I've, I felt responsible since I was pastoring. I felt like, you know, I'm just not doing a good job. And I was just saying, Lord, you know, I mean, I understand we go through, we're like this. We're not always on a high. I understand that. I mean, 47 years, I understand it in this faith. But you can't just drift off. You can't just find yourself out in the middle of the ocean. Somewhere along the line, okay, let's say you're on a raft. And sometimes you're in a riptide. Well, you can't fight the riptide. You know, you exhaust yourself People that try to fight a riptide, they drown, you know. So you don't do that. What you have to do is you have to let it take you. And then after it's over, you come back, you know. Or you swim parallel, you know, they say to the, and get out of it. But as long as you're in it, it's got you. You don't have it. And the strongest swimmers can't swim against a a riptide. But let's say you're on a raft. And this is your life in the Lord, your Christian walk. And you're drifting. You're drifting. And that's a way, there's, like the ocean has conditions. Have you ever been to the ocean very much? I have. I mean, you know, every day is different. Every single day is different. Sometimes it's just as calm as can be. Sometimes there's large waves. I mean, it's just different every single day. And so that's the way our life is. There's times in our life where there's different conditions that we're going through. And under those conditions, we're going to be carried out a little bit. I don't care. You could be strong in faith like Abraham and still say, Sarah, you're a beautiful woman. uh, And we're going to Egypt and they're going to see you're a beautiful woman. And if they know you're married to me, they'll kill you to get you. So tell them you're my sister. Now, this is the father of the faithful, you know. So if the father of the faithful, yeah, I mean, he could have, he could have. He could have said, well, the Lord will provide a way. But he, but he didn't, you know, at that point. He's a human being like we all are. And, of course, you can't find fault with Abraham. He's the father of the faithful. But that happens. So sometimes you're going to drift. That was a circumstance in his life where his faith and his walk drifted a little farther out to sea. You see what I'm saying? Now, when he was willing to give his own son Isaac, well, he was right there at the shore. Right? I mean, he wasn't drift out at all. He was solid. He was on solid ground. As much as sand can be solid. So that's going to happen. We're going to, you know, we're going to have those times. But in 2019, and that, that night, I just couldn't go through it. I just couldn't. I, I mean, usually we're all sitting in here and the lights are low and people are praying. But then I'll get up and I'll open in prayer And then we'll sing for a while to music and worship. And then 
will pray and then people, if they're moved to pray, you know, out loud, they will. People do. Sometimes that would happen. And I felt like we just, you know, we were kind of had got complacent and it was my fault. You know, I mean, it comes, it can't, comes back to whoever's leading the church. And so I just came up here on the stage and I just sat down and I just, I just said, Lord, I, I can't do this anymore. I just can't do it anymore. I, you know, I mean, I don't want to pray and worship you like you're not in the room. I want to know. I want, I want your, you know, we've had it before. I mean, where you're just right here and everybody, you just move through the building. It's like you're going through the presence of God like water. You know, like you feel it tangible. And I want that again. I want, to, I want that again. I want your spirit to fall. And then something happened and God's presence fell and his love came into people. The next day, I mean, for two or three weeks, we really couldn't have a regular service. I mean, you just come, we just come and we don't know what's going to happen. <laughs> it's all good, you know. And But people... They could not get enough of one another. I mean, it was the love of God. But what struck me is that I had, I felt, uh, I mean, a slobbering, snotty love, an emotional love for people I did not know. I mean, I go to Walmart. And someone that I might at before had thought, oh, that guy, <laughs> you know, <laughs> oh, that guy, man. Well, that guy was dear to my heart now, you know. I would literally just weep for people. And it wasn't me. Of course, it's not me. But you know what that taught me was, and it wasn't just me. I mean, if it fell on most of the congregation. And people, I'm telling you, they would sit in the pews and hold each other for hours. And it didn't seem long. Didn't, I mean, it didn't seem like it long. And it was something. And I asked the Lord, what is that about? And he said, healing. People are being healed. But you know, you can forget what you've seen and what you witnessed, just like Simon Ferris, the Pharisee. You can forget, like the children of Israel. Well, they saw all the miracles in Egypt. Moses performing them. God used Moses. He uses people. And he used Moses. And he used Jesus. And he used Paul. And he used Gideon, and he used Samson, and he used his people. He used Esther to save the whole nation of Israel. And, you know, when he walked the earth, that love came through, amen? He expressed his love to untouchables. I mean, he was, he was criticized for, you know, sitting with sinners and, and, you know. But, you know, he saw the difference. He knew that everyone was a sinner. The Pharisees were sinners, but they had sin that they didn't know about. They didn't know that they were self-righteous. Amen. But they were. So I had that love. I mean, that deep yearning. I just, look, there was people that had done me wrong. There was people that had, that had uh, attacked me. I mean, if you're a pastor, you get attacked through the years. You know, it happens. And so I, I've, I had things like that happen, you know. And you know what? All I cared, all I cared about was loving them. That's all I cared about. I felt God. I mean, I, did, I wanted... Reconciliation. I wanted, I wanted, you know, things to be fixed. I, I didn't, I didn't want them to, to have to say I'm sorry. I didn't care. I didn't care one bit. 
Not at all. All I wanted to do was let me hold you and not let go. And I knew that was the Lord in me. And it was the Lord in several other people that was in the congregation also. That, and we saw so many miracles and things happen. So I know, I know what the love of God is and I know what it's not. And I know, you know, painfully know the difference between just my own love, even though, you know, I mean, there's one thing to know about the love of God. It's a whole other thing to have the love of God in you and operating. And so I felt the yearning and I knew this. And so did everyone else that received that love here because it fell on most everybody by the next day and stayed for months. And then when it began to lift, it was devastating. People just went into depressive states. It was awful. But I could feel that it was the love of the bridegroom the, for, the, for the bride. That's what it was. It was the yearning, the longing. Verse 20 again, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Verse 1 of chapter 5, whoever believes that Jesus is the Christ is born of God. And whoever loves the father loves the child born of him. And by this that we know that we love the children of God when we love God and observe his commandments. For this is the commandment. <clears throat> For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not a burden. And then in, in uh, 2 John verse 6, John says, And this is love that we walk according to his commandments. This is a commandment just as you have heard from the beginning that you should walk in it. And of course, we, we strive to walk in the commandments of God as best as we can. Jesus said that all the commandments are summed, up, are summed up into two great principles, love toward God and love toward man. But love without obedience means nothing. And, and just like faith without obedience is not faith. Faith without obedience is not faith. Obedience is the evidence of faith. And obedience to God's commandments is the evidence of love. You can say that you love, but if you don't love to the point to where you lay down and give. You know, that's what James said. Pure religion is this, that, you know, you care for the widows and the orphans. You visit those who are imprisoned, you see. That's pure religion, he said, you know. And that you keep yourself unstained from the world, the ways of the world. The ways of this world is temporary. The world is passing away and all the things in it. You know, we don't want our treasure on this earth. It's good to have the things. The Lord put us here on this earth. He gave us this world. But he said, don't love the things of the world. Don't love the things. Your life consists more. You were not. You are, were created for eternity. The Bible actually says that God has placed eternity in the heart of every man. We, have a, we were created for eternity and to live with the Lord forever. So, you know, we have to demonstrate. I mean, we can look and say, what, how do I know I love God? Do you want to please him? Um, are you living to please him? Does it grieve you when you do something that you know you shouldn't do? Does that grieve you? Do you have, do you, are you having problems forgiving people? You know, are, do you, are you having problems being patient or suffering long? Because self, love will do that. Love will suffer long. It's automatic. We have to pursue love. You know, that's what Paul said. We want all the gifts and there's some flashy gifts, like the gifts of miracles, the gift of healings, you know, 
prophecy, those are great. But without love, it means nothing, like he says in 1 Corinthians 13. So love is the most excellent way. And so what he said for us to do at the end of that is to abide in these three essentials. That's faith, hope, and love. Because faith is the belief that it's your trust in God right now. And hope is the assurance of things to come, good things to come. You know, that we're hoping in good things to come. And of course, love is the very character and essence of what God is. Let's go to John chapter 13. And of course, John chapter 13 is the last Passover that Jesus took with his apostles before he was arrested. And, but here in uh, chapter 13, we'll begin in verse uh, 31 or verse 32, 34, let's say. He said, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. And by this all men will know that you are my disciples, if you have love for one another. Then in chapter 14, notice verse 15, and Jesus is telling his disciples, these things, before he would, he would later be resurrected, he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. Verse 21 says, and he who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him, and I will disclose myself to him. I will reveal myself to those who love me. How do you know you love him? You obey him. You want to please him. You seek to please the Lord. Amen. And so that's what God wants of us. He wants, you know, the Bible says, ask the question, can two walk together unless they be agreed? And the answer is no, they can't unless they be agreed. And can we walk with God unless we're agreed with him? Well, the answer is no. And we're, we're not only made to walk with God, we're made to be one with the Lord. You know, the last Passover, as we just read chapter 17, Jesus says the Father, he said, Father, I pray that they would be one as you and I are one. You and me, I and you, they and us, that we would be one. You can't get closer than that. Amen. So let's strive to love one another and let's understand that he yearns for us. You know, some of us, we felt that. We, we know what that is, to just yearn, our heart just ache. You know, any separation, any, I mean, it was a, you could not get close enough to someone. It was like you you're trying to be one with someone. You just hug people. I mean, I'm telling you, men, men, women, women, men and women, it didn't matter because it was all pure, absolutely perfectly pure. And so it showed us how God feels. It shows us what showed, showed us how God actually feels about us and what he wants. That, that was a lesson that we learned, that we learned from it, you know. And so... He's, he's anxiously awaiting. He wants us to come to him. You mean, amen? All right. Uh, Shirley, would you close us in prayer? You mind? Well, you, you, can, you can assign somebody else if you want. <laughs> <laughs>